Well, thank you so much for the invitation and for this you know, very kind introduction. Um, so this is going to be an applied theory paper uh, about privacy and data markets. So let me jump right into it. All right, so when it comes to privacy, when it comes to privacy, right, not all information about individuals is equal, right? So users consider some data to be more privacy sensitive than other data or some information about themselves to be more privacy sensitive than other information, right? Just as an example, I think most of us will be unconcerned if a firm, one of the major tech platforms say, um, had information that um, allowed them to infer our favorite flower or maybe what's our favorite pet animal. But you know, many of us might not want that same firm to know things like our sexual orientation, political views, maybe certain health information. So data that we do consider to be privacy sensitive. And you know, traditionally privacy preferences and data sharing decisions by users have reflected these differences. So if you consider certain data to be privacy sensitive, you would not share that data, but you would still share the data that you do not consider to be privacy sensitive, especially if you get some um, benefits in exchange. Now, where we come in is we say, well, this you know, strict division of data into deemed sensitive uh, and deemed unsensitive is really challenged by the recent advances in machine learning uh, and prediction technology. Right, and the reason is that much of predictive analytics is about detecting correlations in big data sets, in particular correlations between different personal attributes. Right, and what that means is that it might be possible to learn about an individual's you know, political views, sexual orientation, uh, or another characteristic that is considered to be privacy sensitive from that same person's flower buying preferences or whether that person, you know, likes pet vi um, dog videos or cat videos on Facebook, right? So sensitive data may be inferred from seemingly innocuous data, right? So again, that strict division of data into sensitive and non-sensitive is really challenged um, by a prediction. So that then leads to kind of a new way of viewing privacy preferences where rather than being concerned about the sensitivity of a particular piece of data, right, individuals now need to be concerned about what information can potentially be inferred from that piece of data. Again, because that data is correlated with other potentially more privacy sensitive traits, and firms might be able to figure out those correlations um, through their um, uh, predictive analytics. And what our paper does is we analyze the implications both for users' data sharing decisions and for firm strategy of this new way of viewing um, privacy preference. So let me give you a quick overview um, of the model we use in order to analyze these implications. So I'm gonna show you a model of data markets in which importantly, every individual user's data or every individual user's attributes um, is multidimensional, two-dimensional in the model because that's enough to, to um, create interesting um, dynamics. One of the data dimensions is going to be privacy sensitive, the other isn't, and consumers all agree on which of the two dimensions is privacy sensitive, but we do allow consumers to be heterogeneous in how strongly they value privacy in the sensitive sense. The users enter our digital economy sequentially, and then when a user enters, um, that user has a decision to share no data, neither the sensitive nor the non-sensitive data, only the non-sensitive data, or all of their data, all of their information. Now, importantly, whenever a user shares only their non-sensitive data, the firm tries to then predict the user's sensitive data from the non-sensitive data that the user has shared. So the firm uses its belief, its current belief about the correlation between the two data dimensions in order to try to draw inferences from a user's non-sensitive data about their sensitive characteristics. Now, how does the firm learn about the correlation between the two data dimensions? 
the firm learns about the correlation of the different data that I mentioned from the data that it accumulates, so from the data that users share, right? So whenever a user shares full data, that is going to allow um, the firm to update its belief about the correlation of the two um, data dimensions. Note that we're not going to assume any ex ante correlation between different users. So um, there is no sense in which the data of user A directly conveys some information about the data of user B. All of the externalities between users come from the firm's learning about this correlation between the different data dimensions. Now, our key result is going to be that as the firm accumulates more data and therefore becomes better at predicting the correlation between the different dimensions of users' data, and it's going to be better able to infer sensitive data from non-sensitive data, users' data sharing decisions are going to polarize. Okay. So what does that mean? That means our prediction is that more users are going to share no data at all, even the data that they consider to be non-sensitive and would be happy to share in the absence of this learning-induced externalities. And these consumers are, you know, who we doubt, digital hermits. And then at the same time, we're also going to have more users sharing all their data, including the data dimension that they do consider to be privacy sensitive. All right, so we get this polarization in the middle ground, kind of the obvious choice of sharing the non-sensitive data by keeping the sensitive data private, that middle ground is going to wash away. Right? The share of consumers who you know, opt for what seems to be the obvious strategy becomes smaller and smaller over time. And we find that this polarization arises both when the benefits that users receive for sharing their data or the data prices in our economic model, when they are fixed, when they're exogenous, but also when the um, benefits that consumers receive are set endogenously by the firm and can be adjusted over time. So let me um, try to explain why this happens, why we get this polarization. So the main mechanism behind um, our uh, main result. So the key mechanism is that when the user shares their full data, non-sensitive and sensitive data, that user is going to impose a negative externality on later users who decide to share only non-sensitive data. So whenever a user shares full data, that's going to allow the firm to learn more about the correlation between the different data dimensions, which in turn means that now the inferences from non-sensitive data to sensitive data that the firm can make are going to be more accurate. And that's bad news for a later user who wants to share only the non-sensitive data, because now the firm can better draw inferences about that user's sensitive data from their non-sensitive data. So that later user is going to suffer a greater privacy loss. Right? And that's the negative externality. To make this very concrete, consider a social media example. A little bit silly, I hope you don't mind, where we have users who derive utility from engaging, could be through posts, comments, likes, shares, both with content about pets, dog and pet videos, and also with content about politics, but who may consider their political views to be privacy sensitive. Right? So in that context, a full data sharer would be someone who engages with both types of content but a non-sensitive data sharer would be someone who engages with content about pets, but not with content about politics in order to protect their sensitive information. Right? They don't want their political views to be known. Now, full data sharers here allow the firm to learn something about the correlation between pet preferences and political views. So for example, the firm might learn that Cat or dog lovers are more or less likely to be Democrat or Republican. Not sure what that correlation is, but you might think maybe dog lovers are more likely to be Republican, cat lovers more likely to be Democrat. Maybe it's the other way around. But as the firm accumulates more and more social media data, 
it's gonna be able to infer something about this population. Now this is bad news, right, for a user who likes to engage with pet content, but who has sufficiently strong preferences to wanna keep their political views private. So someone who would like to engage in non-sensitive partial data shared. So what does that imply for user optimal decisions? Well, over time, you know, as the firm accumulates more and more data, and so this negative externality really kicks in, a user is kind of left with two decisions, right? Either if the user values privacy sufficiently strongly, then you know, the user should just share no data at all. Meaning in our example here, you do not post engage with pet content in order to keep your political views private. So you're gonna forego um, the benefit of engaging in um, discussions about the non-sensitive dimension in order to keep the sensitive dimension private. So do not post about cats and dogs because that's the only way to keep your political views private. So you become a digital herb. Or you could um, choose the other extreme where you're basically gonna give up and you become a full data sharer. So if you don't value um, privacy about political views quite as strongly while well, you're going to maybe reason that, you know, my political views, they will be inferred from my other online activity anyways. So I might as well get the benefits of engaging this political content, although I would rather keep that. And so this mechanism is really our paper in a nutshell, our model in a nutshell. So let me um, say a few words about the contribution to the literature. Um, so this paper contributes to a recent and quite fast growing literature on learning and data externalities across individuals in digital markets. Closest paper to ours is probably um, the one by Asim Mowgli et al. and AJ Micro. Now, you know, there are of course some differences in the modeling approaches in those papers that the common feature is that you know, one user's data is predictive um, about another user's type. So there is some correlation structure. And so if the firm obtains the data about user A, that's gonna allow the firm um, to learn something, not just about A, but also about B. And that's kind of exogenously um, imposed. And the key takeaway uh, of those papers is that because of this um, learning externality, um, we're gonna get lower data prices, so consumers do not get accurately compensated um, for their data and excessive data sharing. Too much data sharing um, from a um, socially optimal point of view. Now, our contribution is to um, basically provide a micro foundation for the data externalities across users, right? So we are the first to allow this multidimensional nature of user data, of an individual user's data. Um, and so then the firm learns about correlation patterns and that leads to the um, externalities in data sharing decisions across users rather than just assuming those externalities, right? And then this modeling innovation actually leads to somewhat more nuanced insights uh, about uh, equilibrium data sharing decisions and data prices, right? So we're finding that the learning-induced externality, it does lead to you know, this full data sharing, excessive data sharing for some users, but at the same time, it also leads to less data sharing for other users, those who value their privacy um, sufficiently. So we also get this group of digital hermits, we get a polarization rather than just a prediction that there will be um, excessive data sharing. And then on top of that, we also find that our learning induced externality actually raises the equilibrium price um, of some data. So it raises the equilibrium price of the uh, non-sensitive data and also of um, full data. So the firm offers more to consumers in order to get those data pieces. So before I move to the model, um, let me talk a little bit about the policy implications um, of our model our study. So the paper now contributes to these ongoing policy debates about um, privacy. Um, as you all know, right, in Europe, we have this sweeping um, privacy regulation, the GDPR, and there are many initiatives 
uh, around the globe that go into a similar direction. Now, these privacy regulations, they're almost all focused on the idea of giving consumers control over their data. Right? So individuals should be able to prevent firms from collecting sensitive data and maybe delete any data that has already been or request deletion of any data that has already been um, collected. And what we're saying is kind of that this emphasis on an individual's control of specific pieces of data may be misplaced because what our model really says is that the privacy concerns arise not so much because users can't control which pieces of data they share, but rather because firms can draw inferences about consumer sensitive information about a broad array um, from a broad array of data about that user, right? And a lot of that data might seem innocuous, right? So if we look at right to be forgotten rules, for instance, well, the effectiveness of those rules will really depend on whether firms can still reinfer the data that the user wanted to forgotten after the deletion or not. And on top of that, you now the user requests data deletion. That doesn't mean that that user doesn't exert a negative externality on others because that data may have already been used to train the prediction algorithm. Right? So we may still get that negative externality. So our model implies that, that a better approach that better kind of fulfills the policy objectives of preserving consumer privacy, protecting consumer privacy, but also you know, improving incentives for consumers to actually participate in the digital econ economy would be to try to regulate inferences about sensitive information rather than give consumers control over particular pieces of data. And there are some um, policy initiatives that already go uh, into that direction. So interestingly, if you look at the new AI Act in the European Union, it actually does say something about um, regulation of inferences because it does prohibit biometric categorization systems that deduce or infer you know, a list of um, characteristics, individual characteristics that are considered to be um, privacy sensitive. And so we think that this is kind of the, the right direction to take because at the end of the day, that's the only way to effectively protect um, consumer privacy. All right, well, let me move on to the model and then I'm sure we can um, chat more about the policy implications during the Q&A later. All right, so it's a game theoretic model. Um, it's gonna be in discrete time. Um, we have one firm and a sequence of short-lived consumers, right? So that means each consumer, each user is alive for one period only. A uh, user's type is a vector, x, y, that consists of the realization of two random variables. Um, they're both binary variables to keep things simple. So each of these variables is either zero or positive, cats or dogs. Um, the random variables follow a joint um, distribution, um, which is very simple again, you know, it could be that both are zero, both are positive, or one is zero, the other positive. And so rho in this distribution is a correlation between the two um, random variables. So rho is the unknown parameter that the firm learns about. If rho is positive, that means that positive uh, realizations of X are associated with positive um, realizations of Y. If rho is negative, that means a positive realization of X is associated with negative realizations of Y. Um, as I mentioned earlier, conditional on this correlation, the, um, the types of any two users or the um, random variables the two users are mutually independent, so there's no direct inferences from one user's type about another user's type. So the firm is going to use the data it accumulates to learn about which of the realizations of X is associated with the high realization of Y, 
And so to keep things simple, we're going to say that our row, our correlation is either positive or negative with each of those two realizations equally likely. So it's empty, the expectation is just that it's zero. And then as the firm accumulates more data, it uses Bayesian updating to revise its belief about rho. So it's going to learn eventually um, with some accuracy if rho is positive or negative. So, you know, are the cats associated with a Republican political views or are the dogs associated with political, um, with Republican political views? Uh, and, you know, the proportions of population averages of each type are known. So the learning is only about the correlation. Now, each consumer then has a data vector, dx, dy. To keep things simple, we're going to say that the firm can perfectly infer the consumer's type in dimension x from their x dimension data and type in dimension y from their y dimension data. Um, and then the timing is going to be as followed. In period zero, right, nature just draws the correlation. And then in every period after that, the firm is going to make offers to um, the current user, one price for sharing just the non-sensitive data, and then another price for sharing in addition also the sensitive data. Then we're gonna be optimal for a consumer to share just the sensitive data, so we can focus on you know either you share um, non-sensitive or you share. And then the consumer decides how much data to share. Again, three possible decisions can be a digital hermit, share nothing, I can share only the non-sensitive, or I can share my full data. And then the firm uses all of the data it has collected to date, so from the first user to the current user, to predict the current user's type. Now what about payoffs? So the firm derives payoffs from accurately predicting user's type. Uh, we don't have a micro foundation for this, but one potential explanation is that if I better understand users' type, I can better persuade users to make purchases. Um, and so formally, we're going to assume that the firm's payoff in period T, rest of any payments, is decreasing in the mean squared error of the firm's estimators of the user's type in each dimension. Um, so we have the mean squared errors here where x hat and y hat here are the firm's base estimators of the current user's type as a function of the full vector of data shared by all the users to date. Okay. And these variance terms here are just included as normalizations so that each of the two terms lies between 0 and 1. So if a firm can perfectly predict um, a user's type and say the current user's type say dimension x and the mean squared error is zero and this first term is just one. If the firm knows nothing, then the mean squared error is equal to the variance and this first term is zero. Now on the user side, we're going to assume that users value privacy in one of the two dimensions, dimension y. This could be either for intrinsic reasons or for instrumental reasons. So we're going to model that again in a reduced form using the same mean squared error of the firm's estimator as in the firm's payoff function, right? So a consumer's payoff now is increasing in the mean squared error of the firm's estimator, right? So consumers like it when the firm is not able to accurately predict their type in the sensitive dimension. And we do allow consumers to differ in how strongly they value privacy. So um, this ratio here is multiplied by a VT, which measures user T's individual privacy valuation. Right? And so this VT is going to be higher for some users than for other users. That's the heterogeneity in um, user privacy valuations. Um, these privacy valuations are distributed IID according to some uniform distribution. Um, they're private information of the user and they're independent of the user's type. So in our model, the decision to share or to this whole data doesn't convey any information about the user's type to the firm. The privacy preferences are independent of the user's type. 
or have a couple of uh, justifications. But let me move on and um, tell you about the prediction quality and then we can get to some of the results. So if a consumer shares no data at all, so if a consumer is a digital hermit, then the mean squared errors are just equal to the variances. It's just the prior believe of the firm. Um, and so the firm doesn't have any information beyond the prior distribution. If the consumer shares their full data, then because we've assumed that the firm can perfectly infer types from data in a dimension, the mean squared errors are zero in both dimensions. And the interesting case, of course, is when the consumer shares only the non-sensitive data, but not the sensitive data. So right in this case, the mean squared error is still zero in the non-sensitive data dimension, the one that the consumer shared. But for the sensitive dimension, the firm must now know, use its current belief about the correlation parameter rho. So rho hat here, is the firm's current belief about the correlation to predict the unshared sensitive data dimension from the shared non-sensitive data. So consumer knows the X, but doesn't know the Y. Um, so what does this posterior belief about the correlation depend on? Well, it um, depends on how many past users have shared full data Right, because it's only when I get a full data vector from a user that I can update my belief about that correlation. And then it depends on how many of those data vectors that have been shared in the past actually indicated a positive correlation. So the row head is really a random variable because of the sampling vari vari variability, excuse me, in K. Um, and you can think of N as the number of past users who have shared for data as the size of the sample that's available to the firm in order to estimate. So larger n means this is a more accurate, more precise estimator. Okay, so we're gonna assume that consumers are very um, well informed here. So notably, they are aware of the current mean squared error of the firm's estimator if the user shares only non-sensitive data. So consumers are aware of the firm's capability of drawing inferences. Um, and then we're gonna look at a pure strategy mark of perfect equilibrium where the state is a number of users who have shared full data so far, right? Because that's a sufficient statistic for the mean squared error of the firm's estimator, again, in the case of partial data sharing. Um, strategies for the firm in the full model, I'm going to offer the price for non-sensitive data and for the sensitive data as a function again of the state. And then a user decides whether to share data, it's a function of the state, the price is the user was offered, and the user's individual privacy valuation, VT. Firms uh, maximize expected discounted payoff. And the user is only alive for one period, so the user maximizes their payoff in the period in which uh, he or she is. Um, so we're going to call um, the reduction in the mean squared error of the firm's estimator when the consumer reveals non-sensitive data versus no data at all, the information leakage from non-sensitive data. So this is basically by how much does the firm's prediction of the sensitive data of the user improve when the firm, when the user shares their non-sensitive data. So how much information leakage is there from the non-sensitive data to sensitive data? So we're gonna call that L, and it's gonna depend on how many past users have shared full data, because that's again the size of the sample that the firm has available to estimate that correlation. Now, as you would expect, the information leakage from non-sensitive data is increasing in N, but at a decreasing rate. So as um, the firm accumulates more full data um, vectors, it improves its prediction of sensitive data from non-sensitive data, but at a decreasing rate. Eventually, additional data is not useful anymore. 
So now we can move to analyzing users' optimal data sharing decisions, given the prices they are offered um, by the firm. So for a consumer, again, there's three choices. If I share no data, well, I don't get paid, but I also don't suffer privacy loss. So my outside option of no data sharing simply gives me a utility of zero. If I share all my data, well, I'm gonna be paid for both dimensions, but I suffer full privacy loss. Um, and the, the cost of that for the consumer depends on how strongly they value privacy. So cost is VT. If I share only my non-sensitive data, well, I only get paid in one dimension, but I only um, suffer a partial privacy loss. How much privacy do I lose in the sensitive dimension? Well, that depends on the current level of information leakage. So the VT is multiplied by the information leakage factor, which again depends on how many full data vectors the firm has collected so far. So the current states, current, current, current ability to um, draw inferences. So then what we find is that, you know, not surprisingly consumers, if they, are, they have low privacy preferences, they're gonna share everything. If they have strong privacy preferences, nothing, and then in between non-sensitive. What's interesting is how these boundaries, the V lower bar and the V upper bar, how they change with the level of information leakage. Right? The easiest way to see this is by looking at a picture. So on the horizontal axis here, we have the information leakage from non-sensitive data, so the firm's ability to draw inferences from non-sensitive to sensitive. What we see is that at low levels of information leakage, consumers either share their full data or they share the non-sensitive data. Nobody shares no data, right? because there's some compensation for sharing non-sensitive data, and the inferences are very bad, so consumers should at least share their non-sensitive data. But as the information leakage rises, we get the polarization that I talked about earlier. So this middle ground washes away, sharing non-sensitive data becomes less and less attractive. And we see more users sharing full data and more users sharing no data. And eventually if the information leakage is high enough, everybody either shares no data, no data or the full data. And nobody shares only non-sensitive data. And that's really the main message of the paper. These pictures um, illustrate the same effect. We have different um, parameters here on the horizontal axis. So here we have N. So it might be that, you know, depending on the parameters, information leakage can never get to these very, very high levels. In that case, we still get the polarization, but we do have some consumers who share non-sensitive data even in the limit. And this here gives you the expected uh, boundaries between the the uh, strategic choices for users. So the takeaway so far of the simple model where the data prices were fixed is that both the share of digital hermits and the share of full data sharers among new users will rise over time as the firm accumulates more data and therefore the information leakage from non-sensitive data to sensitive data. The rest of the paper is about showing that these qualitative insights continue to hold when we endogenize data prices. So when we allow um, the um, firm to actually adjust the data prices over time as its ability to draw inferences improves. See that I've already used up 40 minutes. I'm gonna go very fast over that uh, last part of the paper. Um, so no, the, what happens once we um, endogenize data prices? Well, we first use, look at what are the myopic profit maximizing prices that maximize current period profits. Um, what you see here is this profit consists of two parts, right? So we have the consumers who um, share at least their non-sensitive data. So everybody who has a threshold below the upper bar. So what do I get from each of these consumers? Well, I find out their X, that's their um, non-sensitive dimension. And I find out 
you know, an amount L, but the Y is here, L of the Y because of the information leakage. So the firm's payoff is one plus L minus the PX, the price it has to pay. And then if somebody shares their sensitive data in addition to their non-sensitive data, we have an incremental gain for the firm of one minus L. That's the incremental gain from now getting the non-sensitive the sensitive in addition to the non-sensitive, and I have to pay P. So given that we get the myopic profit maximizing prices, you have the expressions here. What's important here is that the price, myopically optimal price um, that's offered for the non-sensitive data, it increases in the information leakage, and the myopically optimal price for the sensitive data, it falls with the information. Now, if the firm is forward-looking, it's gonna take into account that whenever it collects a full data vector, that's gonna improve its prediction because of the learning. And so that's gonna move the state from N to N plus one. And so that's gonna change the information leakage. And so now we get a dynamic programming problem where the firm has to take into account how its pricing affects the probability of transitioning to the next state where the information leakage increases because of the additional learning if the consumer decides to share their full data. So what we find in terms of the results in the crisis is that for the non-sensitive data, the optimal dynamic price is the same as a myopically optimal price. And the reason is really that it's only the full data vectors that allow the firm to learn, right? So inducing someone to move from no data sharing to non-sensitive data sharing doesn't actually change the probability of transitioning to the next state. And because of that, there's no incentive here to distort that price away from the myopic optimum. The price for sensitive data, on the other hand, so the additional compensation to a user for sharing their sensitive data in addition to their non-sensitive data is lower in the dynamic model with a forward-looking firm than in the myopic case. And the reason is that it's strategic for the firm to slow down um, the collection of full data vectors to slow down its own learning in order to protect future profits. Because as the leakage rises, right? Consumers become less willing to share their non-sensitive data. It becomes more expensive for the firm to get the non-sensitive data, and that actually hurts firm profits. So the firm is actually gonna strategically slow down its own learning in our model. So here are some illustrations of that. So here we have the equilibrium data prices on the left. The um, black line is the price for non-sensitive data that is increasing. And then the various you know, gray and dashed lines here are the price of the sensitive data. If the discount factor is zero, then that price is decreasing um, as the firm accumulates more full data vectors. But if the firm um, has a high discount factor, so it's very forward looking, it can actually be increasing. And that's again because of firm's incentive to slow down its own learning. When we look at the total compensation that's offered to a consumer for sharing all of their data, that is always increasing. And then at the end of the day, if we look at the cutoffs for sharing full data or no data, then even with endogenous prices, we get the same polarization as we had in the benchmark model where prices were exogenously fixed. So we still get that as um, the firm becomes better at drawing inferences, um, the share of consumers who are digital hermits, it rises, and the share of consumers who share all of their data rises and the middle ground washes away. That's the same thing in terms of expectation over time. Okay, so let me conclude with a couple of takeaways. Right, so firm's ability to predict personal data from non-sensitive data improves over time as the firm accumulates more data in our model. That leads to negative externalities from full data sharers to later non-sensitive data sharers. 
And in the full model, the rate of improvement is endogenous. So through its prices, the firm can actually um, influence that rate of improvement. And the big message of, that comes out of our model is that over time, data sharing decisions polarize. So fewer users share non-sensitive data, more users share no data. These are our digital hermits. Uh, and more users share full data. Forward-looking firm may, in our model, want to slow down data collection to protect future profits. And as I discussed earlier, I think the policy implications that come out of this way of you know, viewing and modeling privacy uh, preferences is that giving users control over the data may not be sufficient to protect privacy, and policymakers should therefore consider regulating influence. All right, thank you very much. Let's start the Q&A section. <laughs>